Hello, modern art and beauty. What is beauty? People think art must be beautiful, that beauty is art's main purpose. But modern art people, strangely, don't think that. In fact, in modern art today, beauty is completely out as a purpose. Beauty looks nice, and it's hard to find any problems with it, and that's a problem. There's an old modern artist looking up at me. Beauty that's in the eye of the beholder. Weird beauty, the beauty of ordinary people doing ordinary things. Tragic beauty, pop beauty, primitive beauty. The persistence of beauty in modern art. The beauty virus, how it survives and mutates. That's what this week's programme is about. The artists I'll be meeting mostly won't be at all frightening or insane. It'll be weird. And this is the leader of the beauty cult, Henri Matisse. He will never be annoying, just nice. He liked flowers and music. He liked lovely women and patterns and beautiful sights. And he liked painting them so they looked lovely. What was he on, that Matisse? The picture that sums up Matisse is blue nude. It's always on postcards and posters, and everybody knows it, even if they don't know straight away that it's by Matisse. It's not considered an aggressive picture. It's from the lovely side of modern art, not the anxious side. I could never understand the idea of Matisse. He didn't seem to have an idea. He was always talked about in terms of beautiful colour. I was waiting for the next bit. Beautiful colour and what? And then I got the message, it's beauty itself that Matisse stands for. This just looks like a kind of generic modern art painting, a corny model, corny, dorby brushstrokes. But now we're looking at it, we do see it. We see its roughness, the life in that laboured surface, the rightness of that colour. In fact, Matisse is beautiful because he's perfect. And the answer to the question, colour and what, with Matisse, is the utter surprise of his colour, the unrepeatable smudges and blurs and transparencies and half-revealed things making a harmony. He wanted the labour and pain of creation to be invisible, just pure sensation to be apparent. Why is that enough? It's just a fact that it is. It's the best modern art gets. It's a profound mystery. Matisse and now, they just don't fit. Even Matisse and then was an odd match. In his promo films, he was always desperate to be thought of as completely mild. Matisse said he wanted his art to be like a comfortable armchair for a tired businessman to rest in. He meant that he wanted people who live in an ugly world, the modern world, to find beauty in art. Very few artists now go on about beauty as their main theme. But the history of beauty in modern art is an interesting one, with many twists. Even with contemporary art, the ideas that make the art work are somehow tied to the idea that everyone likes beauty and everyone can't help looking for it. <laughs> This is 1990s beauty, beauty that says be daft and rude as well as beautiful. It's beauty that doesn't mind being obscene. Beauty will be convulsive, André Breton, the surrealist, said in the 1920s, or it will not be at all. With Chris Ophelia, apparently, the idea is that beauty will not be at all if it's going to be all high and mighty and up its own arse, but it 
will be if it's all amazingly intricate and decorative, and partly out of the arse of an elephant. The fact is, beauty is the stuff that mainly steams off the surface of Ophelia's paintings. Ophelia isn't a pure painter like Matisse. He knows what purity is, but he wants to torture it a bit first, subject it to impurities. The elephant dung was kind of tying in, I mean, on one level, was tying in with, the, with ideas of, of um, what might be considered beautiful. I mean, you know, I'd made this decision to make these paintings that were kind of really um, ornate and decorated and kind of full on about attractiveness. And um, I wanted to try to include something in the painting that would um, criticize that. It was like, like an, an opposite to it? Um, in a way, an well, opposite, made, but... It forced you to think about it. what beauty yeah, is. Would, yeah, would challenge what you were looking at. So the beauty isn't too easy? Or... Yeah. Do you think that's a tension of modern art generally, that for beauty to occur at all in modern art, it tends to be in some kind of tension with ugliness? You know, from Matisse onwards, or from... I don't really see the ugliness in Matisse. I think Matisse is so much about a kind of a luxury. Mm. And... Uh, kind of like really lounging type paintings, whereas... Paintings in lounges, or people paintings lounging Paintings in lounging in and lounging, yeah. you know, painting and lounging. It's beauty in a different sense. You know, I'm finding a kind of beauty in, in a, a, quite an urban setting. Beauty with a kind of an urban beat. For me, a degree of beauty is essential. But is it just like an ingredient, or is it the main... It's a very necessary thing. ingredient. And making it with the consideration that people will consume it with their eyes. And so I'm trying to make something that will stimulate their eyes. And I think something that stimulates someone's eyes is something that's beautiful. Ophelia uses low stuff like pornography and wallpaper patterns and day glow colours and comic book drawing. But the way he layers it all together makes these things suddenly seem beautiful. Lumps of ugly dung fabulous colour. Why would that be a good mix? Maybe it's an allegory, a satire on modern art's old entrenched idea of outsiderness. Matisse made traditional Western art new by mixing in non-Western things like distortion. He put the Western tradition under pressure from non-Western art, art like tribal masks, that art wasn't even thought of as art. It was just fetishes and voodoo stuff. But with Matisse, the voodoo look became the modern look. Angular, distorted, unreal. Like Matisse painting his wife with a weird green stripe down her face. At first, it seemed very extreme to do that. But gradually, it became more normal for modern art to look like that. It wasn't new anymore. This is radical art. And so is this. It's radically beautiful, but we don't really see that anymore. We have to think about it to remember how it must have seemed once. Blue Nude was made at the end of Matisse's life, but it's the culmination of a lifetime's obsession with beauty and making it new. Ezra Pound's phrase for the relationship between modernism and tradition, that is, Modern art isn't about destroying the loveliness of the past, but about reinventing it to make it fit the present. Matisse lived in a house called La Reve, the dream. He was detached from modern life. He didn't care about the Second World War. His wife and daughter were in the resistance, but he didn't bother. He just lived in his symbolic world of beauty. He thought that was enough for the war effort. Somehow that sunk in as Matisse's message. It makes the most successful artists of now a bit horrified by him. Artists should be more on the front line, they think. But are they right? Here's our last surviving link with the Matisse world. Patrick Heron, writer on art, painter of abstracts, now in his 80s. 
Let's help him over the rocks at his house in Cornwall, where he's lived nearly all his life. I'm going to go down and make holes in the rocks. In fact, there are rocks in which the holes are right Matisse's rhythms, patterns, colours, Matisse's obsession with the natural world. These are Patrick Heron's obsessions too. It's a harbour shape. Yes, yes, yes. How he was hated by the art world when I was a student. He would just get up and say, conceptual art was boring. This can't be right, the avant-gardists of the 1970s all thought. They never thought about Matisse, and the only time they thought about Patrick Heron was to laugh at his hopeless formalism. How funny that I used to assume they were right. Now, I don't. Everything in Patrick Heron's paintings is abstract and pure. At the same time, it all comes from things that he's seen, the rocks and hills and fields and flowers, his garden, the harbours, the sea, the light around the house in Cornwall where he lives. He doesn't sit in front of these things and sketch them, he just soaks them all up by osmosis and his paintings come out looking like this. What is it that grabs one and uh, sets all one's juices in motion, you know? It must be beauty, actually. So, that, so the beauty, presumably, although a meaningless word, is nevertheless perhaps a word that evokes uh, all kinds of intensely felt and experienced relationships. If you, if you, if you thought of writing down what it was when Heron was an art critic, as well as an artist, he used to go on about pure visual pleasure. But pure visual pleasure is not like champagne or lovely cakes. It's an incredibly difficult idea that lots of people don't want or are afraid of. When you try to analyse something as innocent as beauty, it's amazing how frightening the discussion can get. The subject matter of figurative painting is the least important thing about it. The one thing you apprehend immediately is the fucking subject. The so-called subject is the last thing that you want to dwell on. You don't want to go on gazing, saying, gosh, this is an apple, this is an apple, this is an apple. You can't ever go on looking at anything for more than a millionth of a second, incidentally, without moving your eyes. It's apparently a physical law that your eye gets bored and wants immediately to move. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's really good. Yeah. That's good, isn't it? That's a good one. Yes. You just try slowly swiveling your eye across the visual thing. You can't be done. It goes from this point to that point to that point to that point to that point. <laughs> and the stuff of that is rhythm. When I see a robin hopping from twig to twig, I think how amazing. You know, it springs from point here to point there, but it's all done in jerks all of which have a perfect starting and ending. Well, exactly the same thing is right. happening when you look at something. Wow. I think what's good about that idea is that it's almost, it almost sums up the mechanics of excitement and joy and yeah. pleasure, of, of looking at it as yeah. a work. You know. The enjoyment is entirely to do with colour, shape, interaction. I like this kind of talk, but hardly anyone else does, and I can't really blame them. Our awareness of form and shape. Mm. People don't like it because they think you're bossing them about and telling them... Uh, to pull the socks off and think about quality and form well, and shape and colour, and they don't want it. I, I, I just can't see why people can't understand that the fascination that painting has for us is a fascination with the purely visual. I know that you're uh, almost to the point of obsession mm. interested in Matisse. Yes, but I can remember the day in which Cezanne, as the centre of my world of visual consciousness, suddenly started to move sideways out of the centre centre of focus, and this character called Matisse started to slide in, and I can remember the crudity and the ugliness of the Matisse. William Scott once said something very interesting. He said, "The beauty of the thing badly done." And that's rather hot stuff, actually. The Matisse Museum in Nice. It's airy calm. It's not Matisse himself we miss somehow today. It's what he stands for. He stands for being bourgeois, and of course we must never be that. But he also stands for awkwardness and oddness turning into beauty, one thing becoming another. Matisse's stylized wave pattern, his long wave message of beauty. Can it reach us now in our skeptical age?
I think we're skeptical and passionate at the same time. We talk about beauty in different ways now. Ophelia's street style, Heron's old style, and we find beauty in peculiar places. But we wouldn't find it at all if we didn't somehow still have a dream of beauty. Up here on the cosmic plane. This is the site of a strange twist in the story of beauty, the green fields of Bennington Women's College in Bennington, Vermont, home in the 1960s to Greenbergian formalism. Greenberg was Clement Greenberg, the most powerful art critic America has ever known. And formalism was the style of art that Greenberg championed. Formalism meant shapes and colours good, recognisable imagery and illusion bad. A handful of artists that were the main formalists did pure abstract art. And for a while in the 60s and into the 70s, they were at the top of the tree. One of them, Jules Zalitsky, Greenberg said was the best painter alive. Now, nobody talks about him. Or about Greenberg, or Clem, as he was affectionately known, or about formalism. The death of formalism was like the 70s stadium rock bands suddenly dying like dinosaurs. Only in this case, with no chance of a big 1990s comeback tour. I'm making a comeback now to an artist who puzzled and impressed me when I was a student. Jules Zalitsky, the greatest painter alive, Greenberg once said, inventor in 1966 of the spray painting style. Everyone was impressed by it and it was incredibly influential. Formalism was an idea about beauty, but it was beauty reduced to colour and flatness. And Olitsky was a master of both. He was the cutting edge, everyone said. But then suddenly, a cold wind blew on flatness, and Olitsky was totally out. No one knows why, it's just life. You're in, and then you're out. You're so cold, you're practically dead, but actually, you're still alive. Litsky's studio is up there in that forest. He's in his 70s now, still painting furiously. And I'm going up there to see him, to ask him what beauty means to him, now that no one cares about flatness, and no one believes in the old frameworks that made his abstract beauty meaningful. What's it like to have the idea still ringing in his head from the 1960s? Jules Zalitsky, the best painter alive. When Clem said, Jules is the best living painter, oh, I loved that. Because it came from him. I knew it came with a great cost, the cost of brickbats that would be thrown at me and which still uh, occasionally are. Uh, I still get some. <laughs> I'm not entirely forgotten, you see. Why is he painting skies and sunsets now? Why should the old masters have had all the fun? I just wanted to start making landscapes and fooling around with watercolour and pastels. I'd never done that. They think the cutting edge is, uh, you know, hanging a side of beef or something. Uh, but uh, maybe it takes more courage to paint a, <laughs> a sunset. Beautiful nature. The loons warbling, the sun setting, Olitsky rising to the beauty theme. You know, Oscar Wilde said nature imitates art. You know, before uh, Monet painted sunsets, no one w looked at sunsets. Now everyone goes, oh, look, there's a sunset. Or the people in London began walking into poles because they noticed finally there was fog. You know, before Whistler painted the fog, uh, no one <laughs> walked into telephone poles. <laughs> uh, stuff like that. So to, to that extent, natural beauty is in yes. a sense discovered by artists first right. and then we start to find it in nature. Do you think beauty is a value, a substantial yes. value? Yes, yeah, I think it is in itself a, a, a value and I would hope the work is beautiful. And especially now because it has become sort of politically incorrect in art that uh, art should be beautiful. Olitsky only paints at night. 
Each evening he sets up his materials and puts his old cassette tapes on. Outside, the loons are calling. Inside, it's Madame Butterfly or ancient rock and roll. Good night, Alitsky. Try and keep the noise down. Your story isn't over yet. I'll be up early to tell some more of it. This is an art storage shed, right out in the middle of nowhere. Hundreds of Alitskys are stored in there. His whole back catalogue for the occasional buyer to come round and get the Alitsky vision full on. What a thunderous atmosphere. It's history humming its heavy abstract sound, calling out to me. In these racks are stored Alitsky's shapes and colors from the past, like his art from the 1960s. It has something we want, but too much that we don't. I like Alitsky's stoked up, iridescent beauty, but how strange it is, without the framework of attitudes and ideas that make us up at different times. It's called the zeitgeist, the time spirit now artificially frozen inside this metal shed. The zeitgeist is what makes us feel in tune with art, or if it suddenly changes and there's a new zeitgeist out of tune. Pay attention. Zeitgeist said beauty wasn't in just flatness and colour, but in the mind, in the postmodern scrambled mind, all speeded up with the past and the present, all upside down, and low culture and high culture all mangled up. The chart of isms makes up the standard story of modern art. I see it all rushing by right now, beauty and ugliness rushing after each other. Cubism. Very ugly at first, but very beautiful compared to futurism. Futurism, fantastically ugly, but like the Sistine Chapel compared to surrealism. Surrealism, harmonious compared to abstract expressionism, and so on. Then the chart runs out and postmodernism begins. All the old styles are up for grabs now, but none of the meanings are the same. Beauty and ugliness, out for a walk, not recognizing each other on the street. These are paintings by someone who couldn't help but paint incredibly well. He liked ordinary pleasures, like Matisse did, but he certainly didn't try to present himself as ordinary. In fact, he couldn't help but be a star, to be beautiful. Jean-Michel Basquiat started out as a graffiti artist, spray-painting imagery and words on the New York subway and signing them same old, meaning same old shit. From hanging around at New York music clubs, he was a musician as well as a graffiti artist, he came into contact with established art. And through that, his own art became more and more densely layered and rich. He started being in exhibitions in 1980. By 1982, he'd been taken up by a gallery and had his first one-man show. He was off the streets and in the art world, and he immediately became famous. He was the first black art star. He stayed successful for six years, but during that time became increasingly distracted by drugs until finally dying of a heroin overdose in 1988, aged only 27.
People think Basquiat is either only superficial or amazingly soulful. But no one says he's actually an artist as good as Matisse, but I think he is. Some critics say the glamorous life that Basquiat led could never go with authentic art, but modern life is like that. It's full of things you wouldn't think would fit. A typical Basquiat is a visually jarring pile-up of random words and scratchy wild drawing and gestures and lunges of pure colour. The words are image words, like beat poetry, lifted from articles about the president or Negro bone structure or jazz or the chemical composition of lighter fuel. Basquiat's drawing of faces and figures is graphically incredibly striking, like Picasso, but it's the archetypal features of black men that stare out of Basquiat's pictures rather than a cast of mythic Mediterranean characters, the fauns and centaurs and sexy nymphs of Picasso. And Basquiat's colour is very strong, but incredibly subtly orchestrated. Basquiat can't be pinned down now because he's too close. In the future, he will level out with established great artists. The things that made him paint well will come to seem more like the things that drove them. Matisse's love of the good life, Basquiat's love of the same thing. <laughs> in LA, where Basquiat sometimes found himself in the 80s, in a daze. It's the beauty of life, of light and excitement, and sunshine and palm trees, and healthy bodies and music, and sexy rock stars. And now, I'm coming up the stairs with Dennis Hopper. Do we care what he thinks about art? Yes, because as well as an icon of hip culture, he's a painter, and a photographer, and an art collector. In the 1960s, he was one of the first collectors of pop art, and in the 1980s, he collected Jean-Michel Basquiat. But my thing is that uh, America was always emulating the Europeans before, yeah. uh, before abstract expressionism. And then once you got into second and third generation abstract expressionisms, we were looking for a return to reality. Mm. And the return to reality was the soup can, the Coca-Cola bottle, the comic book, uh, the reality of the popular culture and the commercial culture that we lived in. So uh, Basquiat then had that to face to find a new way. I mean, coming out of abstract expressionism and going into, like, pop art and the commercial world and then to come back out of that and try to find a, a space for yourself as an artist is really amazing, and it just got better. Basquiat never said much in interviews. He had the big picture in his head, but his interviewers were small time. You feel that the press is, like, making kind of a certain mystique around you that's not really accurate? I mean, a certain mystique. Well, a certain image of you. What do you mean by, by, by the press? Is the press one person? The, the, art, the art press. It's not, it's not one person. They, 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 just, they rely on third and fourth hand information too much. Yeah, and uh, they're... Because I really, I'm, I'm more reluctant to talk to them for, for fear of put, putting my foot in my own mouth, you know? I mean, they just quote, quote me out of context, you know? Jean-Michel Basquiat is as much of the 20th century as any artist that I know. I, I just, uh, I think he, he has it all. Robert Hughes was saying that, oh, mm. he's just a medium-rate artist. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, Rob, mean, Robert Hughes may be just a medium-rate uh, critic, you know? I mean, I don't know, it's possible. He, he might be. <laughs> but what's your own perception? Well, he is Australian, you know. Well, that probably explains it, yeah. <laughs> it gets everything upside down. <laughs> Sorry, Robert Hughes. It's the scrambled world again. Cultures, authentic outsiders, used to sell laptops. Basquiat used to walk these streets with hundreds of thousands of dollars in shopping bags from his art sales. 
he enjoyed his contradictions. Art critics found them confusing. I don't have any cynicism about him, though. He never said much in interviews, but there was a big idea to his art. He stands for a uniquely postmodern type of beauty. He does something a lot of painters today want to do, or think they're doing, but with them, it comes out too controlled or tweed. With him, it's alive. He had an incredible natural facility. You could make odd things work together in a beautiful way. So even though his tension of the odd and the beautiful is what Picasso and Matisse are all about, and Basquiat is jokey and savage like Picasso, a startling colorist like Matisse, with Basquiat, it's all coming from the opposite direction, from outsider culture to high culture, from natural iconoclasm to fabulous sophistication. Do you think your ethnic background is hindering or helping you? I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I wouldn't say I, I don't exploit it. You, know? you, you don't exploit it? Do you, do you feel others are exploiting it? It's possible. Oh. That's, uh... Uh, okay, uh, let, let's, let's look. See, I, I put my phone by my own, in my, my own mouth, man. No, well... Take that camera off, man, for a minute. Yeah. Okay. With art, there's lots of problems about beauty, but with people, it's not such a problem. Everyone knows pretty quickly if they find a person beautiful or not. Some people actually have the job to be beautiful people. They're stars. Everyone loves them. They're glamorous and polished and perfect and unreal. Sometimes there are. This is the art of Elizabeth Payton. It doesn't seem like modern art. It's beautiful in the way we say a fashion design is beautiful. She paints stars. Sometimes it's just her friends. Mostly it's the famous or the mega famous. She's already a big star herself, an art star. She answers a recent appetite for Roots art, not brainy or ironic, just nice and a bit sincere. She does angelic beauty, sweet, feminine, like her version of Britpop's most famous brothers as infants. But even when they're not children anymore, she takes the grungy realism out of her beautiful stars and leaves them just starry and pretty. There's like loads of glamorous beauties out there and that's not the sort of beauty I'm interested in. I mean, more the beauty I'm interested in is the kind that comes from being really willful and talented and making beautiful things. And I think that gives your person a kind of very special beauty. And some of those people happen to be famous. When the o Oasis was huge, every week in NME you'd get male writers talking about how pretty Liam was. Like, Liam came down the elevator in the hotel and the doors opened and it was like, you know, men getting their breath taken away by him. So it wasn't just me that was thinking he was very pretty. I think if a portrait seems to come from a Matisse world of art, but if another portrait seems to come from a pop world of art, there's a natural tendency to think that the pop world it's less interesting and therefore that portrait has less importance. It's probably only because the pop world is so new. Like there was one um, painter, Gro, G-R-O-S, and he devoted himself to Napoleon and when Napoleon lost power, he killed himself. So that's really the work of a fan? Well, I wouldn't call it a fan. He was, you know, taking down history, but he was also in love with him. I mean, I, I think about history painting a lot and religious paintings a lot, like, there was a painting of Noel that I did of him coming through Heathrow when the band supposedly broke up. And there's just so much press coming in, or this picture of Ronaldo um, when he came back to Brazil. And just the crush of him, all these people looking at him, it's just such a historical moment and such a personal moment. If a newspaper editor, editor got that on the desk, I think, yes, that is the photo. But for an artist, what, are you thinking like a newspaper editor or do you think there's something there for an artist? Well, I mean, I was thinking, wow, Ronaldo's just had his panic attack. Maybe his girlfriend was poking the TV journalist, maybe not, who knows what happened, but he had a huge anxiety attack and he lost the game and he played horribly. And um, he's this great player and he's 21 and he's coming back to Brazil and he's right off the airplane and, I mean, what a moment that must have been for him. Yeah. And I love his Brazil jacket. Oh, right. Their outfits are so great. Yeah. And is this, is this from there? Yeah. Can I pick it up? It's looking really bad right now. Oh, well, uh, I'm sure it doesn't. It looks great. 
Mm. It looks like a, a painting that's, it looks really alive, actually. But are you, what you're worried about, what's going to happen up there? Oh, no, I like that part. I like right. the mess there. <laughs> what don't you like? It's just the colour of his skin right now. It's looking a little plastic. It's not right. really glowing yet. You've made him much more fawn-like and sort of elfin and like Nijinsky or something. I mean, he is beautiful, but he's got a much more sort of masculine, rugged look, and you've sort of thinned him out a lot and made more sort of pretty mouth, you know, which is a kind of process that they all seem to go through. <laughs> Beauty isn't stronger than fashion. Artists can be the height of fashion, then they can be completely out. Peyton's post-pop beauty is in, at least for now. There can't be many sights in the world more beautiful than what I'm seeing now. A beautiful lake, beautiful trees, beautiful skies. Nice houses with elegant, untroubled people enjoying themselves on a sun deck with beautiful light flooding down on them. What place is there for modern art here where everything seems so okay? Alex Katz. He's been in and out of fashion since the 50s. He was in in the 60s because his pictures looked a bit pop. Now he's in because they look a bit Liz Payton. Beautiful, elegant, bland. I think there's a, an unconscious idea that modern art is really about beautiful ideas or sublime ideas or big thoughts. To paint people who are beautiful or trees which are beautiful or landscapes which are beautiful. It's rather an odd thing for a modern artist to be doing. Oh, I think so. Uh, I think um, uh, particularly in figurative art, which is generally meant, meant to serve some social function rather than a more optical one, I wanted to make an art that was elegant. The idea of beauty seemed like a great vehicle for the kind of elegant painting I was looking for. Beauty is usually associated with something that's kind of soft. With secondary second, 19th second, century French yeah, artists. Bad, who, bad art. But and they were going to be defeated by rugged impressionism. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking of uh, my, my point. Beauty was, for me, was like Nefertiti. And Nefertiti is absolutely first class. And I was trying to make something elegant to make a, a painting that would uh, really hold up to a, a, a muscular, abstract expressionist painting. The impressionist paintings at, at Matisse and Picasso all work with kind of a slower light. I like the quick light of uh, de Kooning and I like the quick light of Sargent. And what, what do you mean exactly by quick light? Well, when you look at the paintings, they go pop real quick. You want something that has the impact of a sign? Yeah, yeah I want it like a sign. I want it to come off that canvas and just knock you out. And now the large paintings I'm doing, these landscapes, are um, uh, an attempt to, to blow up some of these things like 20 minute sensations. A sunset you have from 7.30 to 7.45 to do the painting. And then you try it again the next night. And then I try to paint a big painting that has that sensation, that high-speed sensation. from some piers in the ocean. The water's all in motion. It's incredibly uh, rich, the, the sort of flatness of that and the depth of it, that you, could, you feel like you could go into it and well, start making this pattern all over Water the is one of those, um, water is, is similar to flowers. It's in, uh, on, on, on one level, it's, uh, see how, you have very few people who paint flowers well or paint water well. Yeah. <laughs> and with water you have reflection, you have depth, and you have motion, and you have weight. And that's what I'm trying to do. 
Listening to the lulling sound of cats talking, and with all this beautiful light flooding down, it's like the early evening cocktails kicking in. It's easy to forget these paintings are feats of technical brilliance, like Japanese prints. Each one is completed in a day to get exactly the right precise split-second image in all its ordinary niceness. It only works at all if it works in an instant, in a pop. These ordinary faces, the weird reality that Katz's 14 feet high ideal reality oil paintings are based on. Well, goodbye, Maine, where Alex Katz lives, and hello, London, where I live, and where Gary Hume made this video. Gary Hume is a painter. His paintings are stately and beautiful. This video isn't. It's grungy and horrible. You don't have to be a semiologist to interpret the signs. Just interpret the anagram of the title. Hume made it when he was going through an identity crisis, wondering what painting was, what beauty was, and what meaning was. It made him all mad and nutty. But then after his recovery, his paintings became more and more straightforwardly colourful and decorative, as if decorative had never been a bad word. This picture is called Vicious, after the song by Lou Reed. You hit me with a flower, the words went. Shapes spread out, elegant and decorative, with eye-dazzling colour. The pose here is from high art. The image was got from tabloid culture, a news photo of Patsy Kensit. The painting is called Begging For It. These pictures are so hard and the surfaces so sheened, I never know if it's right to be moved by them or if I should just be smiling wryly. Hume paints with gloss paint, gallons of it. Matisse's ideal of natural beauty the artificial, unnatural, lowest common denominator beauty of the BNQ colour chart. They come together in a decorative painting of flowers, flowers that might hit you. I go into his lair, smiling nervously. I do feel like people should just fucking, you know, fall down and weep in front of my paintings because they are so gorgeous. And when they don't, and they just nod, you go, oh, it's OK. Then, then, um, it's, um, then I think something's going wrong and it's either that I'm a deluded artist who, think, who thinks I'm um, better at making this stuff than I am or that um, um, I'm still ahead. They have a beauty about them, but it's not, it's not like a majestic beauty where, like seeing a beautiful woman or something and you suddenly just have to turn and she's just excellent all of a sudden and you know that there is excellence. These aren't head turners, these are more like acts of faith. What stage is this one at, Gary? It's um, almost finished. And who is it? It's Jesus. <laughs> and where did you get the image of Jesus from? It came from the Daily Mail. Right. Um, it's just a deaf boy. Right. who had an operation and got his hearing back. Um, but I was trying to make him a, a Byzantian CNA, Jesus. Right. So to try and make Jesus into a, um, a, a poor person again, a nice working class boy. That's a beautiful idea. faith. We'd like to have it. We don't know what it is. Matisse's faith was the faith of an artist in beauty to be transcendent, to make everything be all right. But now we're in an age of no faith at all in anything. All these beautiful plant shapes and startling reflected light are the details that animate the Matisse Chapel in the south of France. It's where I am now, in the confessional, 
thinking. Is Matisse an artist I only like as relief from the rush of nowadays when I'm feeling a bit solemn and tragic? Since this is a place for telling the truth, why would that be so bad? It's not as if I don't have a soul, is it? Matisse said what he did with this chapel was to create a religious space, to take an enclosed space of reduced dimensions and to give it solely through the play of colours and lines the dimensions of infinity. What does that mean if you don't believe in infinity, or even 40 years after his death, particularly believe in Matisse either? How does the chapel work then? The first impression coming in through that confessional door is of whiteness. The next impression is the amazing crudeness of these black marks, as if you could imagine holding one of these tiles and painting it on yourself. Then the eye follows around these Dorby lines to reveal an open, curvy pattern contrasting with a denser jumble of Jackson Pollock rhythms over there. The next impression is of coloured light flooding in through that set of stained glass windows. Then you begin to wonder what these decorative patterns are actually depicting. That one is a nativity, the Madonna rising up out of the flowers of nature, the Christ child rising up out of the Madonna, arms outstretched, anticipating the crucifixion position. That one is the 14 stations of the cross, the numbers conveniently scribbled in, the dramas all revolving around the central crucifixion scene. Religion, the spirit, beauty. Before modern art, they were connected. With modern art, they were all split up. Can they still work when they're in bits? Matisse himself was barely held together now by a surgical corset. He was dying from a terrible digestive blockage and a nun had the job of draining him each evening. In all this earthly agony, Matisse thought modern art and the Bible made sense. Picasso didn't like this place. He said Matisse was a non-believer. What was the point of him decorating a chapel? And maybe there's something in that criticism. The suggestion of Matisse's ego, his sentimentalism, his hypocrisy even. On the other hand, when you think about what art was for Matisse, that it was about beauty and simplicity and inner truth, then this place does make sense. It's a simplification, the religiosity taken out and feeling left in, the feeling of what a chapel is for. You come there to be purified, to have, as Matisse said, your burdens lightened. Matisse died in 1954. The cutout shapes he made at the end of his life are still the acceptable face of modern art, bright, logo-like, figurative. If beauty is out as an idea in art now, Actually, ideas are kind of out too, and maybe beauty will creep back. What kind of beauty will it be? Will it be like charity or humble? No, it will be elegant and radiating shallowness, or trembly and streetwise and hip-hop, or trembly and upper class, or poisonous and iridescent, or poppy and pretty, or convulsive and heavy. Maybe it will even be like Matisse. Beauty is a meaningless word, like nice. But we're rushing along and we just suddenly halt in mid-stride and sense it. We know beauty is near. We've seen it in modern art, where it's always been one way or another. It's unexpected harmonies, it's patterns, it's sudden flashes of colour. Even in the world of rush, modern art says, beauty is there. The mud below, the sky above, and the beauty within.
This Is Modern Art continues next week. And for a diary of artistic and cultural events from around Australia, as well as the latest news about music, books and film, visit the SPACE website via ABC Online. Just go to abc.net.au slash arts. Stay with us now for our movie, Hear My Song.